Good evening. My name is Brittany Lee Lewis, and I'll be your host. Thank you so much for tuning in for yet another episode of American Politics. Today's guest is Senator Manka Dingra. She is a prosecutor, behavioral health expert, a domestic violence advocate, and she is currently the senator for Washington's 45th Legislative District. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here. So I wanted to start a little bit about you, um, your personal story, and what motivated you to get involved with politics. You know, um, that's actually such a great question because I don't have the traditional political background. I actually, other than our last national election, was never involved in politics. You know, I considered myself a good Democrat. I voted. Um, and that was the extent of that. And um, our last national election in 2016, I was actually hosting a very large election night party. And the reason why I had decided to host such a large election night party actually goes to when President Obama was elected. At that time, our local newspaper, the Seattle Times, had done this wonderful cover that showed the pictures of all of our presidents. And I was so excited. So I opened the newspaper, put it on our table, and called my kids to come take a look at the faces of our presidents. And I remember my three-year-old daughter running to the table, takes a look at it, and she goes, where's the pictures of all the women? And I had to tell my three-year-old daughter that in America, we did not have a female president. Um, and so four years ago, I decided to have a really large election night party because I wanted to show my now teenage daughter the face of our first female president. Um, obviously, the evening didn't go as planned. And, you know, that result actually uh, really devastated me. And I decided that I had to do something. And at that time, I wasn't sure what that something was. And so for the very first time that December, I went to a local Democratic Party um, meeting. And that February, I announced I was running um, for Senate. I mean, a lot of other things happened in between. But that was really how I got involved in politics. And I'll just say for someone who can walk into their first Democratic Party meeting in December and then run to be a senator, it really goes to show that you know it's all about the community you live in and the support you have at the local level. I love that. Um, still sticking with a little bit about your history, your background, your identity. Uh, you will go down in history as the first sick legislator in the nation. What does that achievement mean to you? And what are some of the challenges, if any, that you've experienced as a sick legislator? Oh my goodness, you don't ask any easy questions, do you? <laughs> You know, it's, it's really interesting because you don't necessarily always think of yourself as the first. Um, you know, I was the first South Asian prosecutor in King County. And um, so there are a lot of firsts when you go into a new field. Um, you know, I didn't realize I was the first sick legislator until I got elected. And I got an email congratulating me on being the first sick legislator. And I'm like, is that really true? Um, you know, what that it means a lot of different things. It actually started off with, um, you know, my husband, my family, and I decided I was going to run for this office because representation matters. And it's very important for our democracy to represent all of us. And so when it even started with the campaign, you know, my husband asked a question because we're a sick family. He was a turban. He said, do you think I should excuse myself from your campaign? Like, should we have a family photo? And, you know, I'm a sick person. I'm a proud sick woman. And I said, absolutely, this is our family. This is who we are. And the sick values of, you know, integrity, honesty, humility, service to the community, seva, is really what has driven me my whole life. Um, so it started off by making sure that we had our full family photo on all my camping materials, including a dog, Sheru. Um, and it went from there and, you know, we all wear a lot of different hats and I wear my faith, my culture, my family background, um, with me and those voices and those experiences do make a difference in the manner in which we present ourselves and, uh, where we come from. So I think it's something that, uh, we are mindful of on a daily basis. I love it. That's such a powerful story. And I'm, um, I'm, I love the fact that you told him to keep his turban on. Um, and I think that's truly what makes America um, so special, right? Is to celebrate different cultures and different identities. Um, 
you know, thinking about the upcoming election, um, specifically with uh, uh, Kamala, you, you recently tweeted that Biden-Harris 2020 is a welcome sign of progress. Her experience as a daughter of immigrants, prosecutor, and woman of color of mixed racial background truly reflects America. Do you believe having Harris on the ticket has created a unique investment among the Indian American community in this presidential election? You know, I think it really has. Um, you know, um, Indian Americans uh, really definitely uh, are one of the most affluent immigrant groups in America. Um, their um, individual wealth is a lot more than most other groups, yet they're really not reflected in politics. And, you know, they definitely um, have given in to the whole model minority stereotype. And I'm really glad that we're having honest conversations about what that means. Um, and what I found when I ran for office, actually, uh, it helped mobilize the South Asian community in a way that I had never seen before, mm -hmm. in a way that a lot of people hadn't seen before, nationally as well as locally. And um, after I ran the following year, we had record number of women of color running all over the country, including a lot of um, South Asian men and women. So um, I really do think that the community has organized. Um, they are paying a lot more attention. And so having um, Kamala Harris on that ticket, I think it's huge. Um, having her represent um, Indians as well as our Black community, and just the whole package. I mean, she is one dynamic, strong woman. And it really brings to bear still, I think what a lot of us feel is the American dream, that this is an America where anyone can be um, president or vice president. And doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of work to do. Um, this American dream cannot be just for the few exceptional people. It needs to be made available to every single child. So um, I think it is very hopeful and I really do think it is our country correcting itself, hopefully, uh, in just next week. Uh, I want to transition a bit more um, to kind of your background and what has prepared you for office. Uh, specifically, I want to know, how did your experience as a prosecutor prepare you for your role as the chair of the Senate Behavioral Health Subcommittee and vice chair of the Senate, at Law, Senate Law and Justice uh, Committee? So, you know, I will say as a prosecutor, um, you, you end up being a really tough cookie, right? You're dealing with very um, um, harsh realities many times of human nature. You do tend to see people at the worst. Um, but, you know, I created and ran a therapeutic alternative unit. So I also have the experience of seeing people change and do so much better. And... Um, you know, when I ran the behavioral health, uh, the I'm sorry, not the behavioral subcommittee, the mental health court, our veterans court, our diversion program, you really get to see um, the struggles that people have. And you really get to see how, when given the right resources and support, people can do so much better. And so I think absolutely my experience in chairing the therapeutic alternative unit and really seeing uh, up close the manner in which we deal with individuals with behavioral health issues um, helps me chair that committee. And uh, I think I may be the only prosecutor in the Senate. And so the Vice Chair of Law and Justice actually works really well uh, because the chair can take a lot of civil matters and then um, I can take a lot of the criminal justice matters. And, you know, being someone who has worked for survivors and victims' rights, um, as well as being a prosecutor and being a woman of color, and having done a lot of work around um, crisis intervention and de-escalation, um, you know, I think my expertise is the timing is just really right to be in the Senate. Mm, absolutely. Uh, so sticking along those same lines, you know, you, you do so much with um, mental health and behavioral health. You serve on the board of the National Alliance on Mental Illness Eastside. You're also the chair of the Therapeutic Alternative Unit. Uh, you've helped develop and oversee the Regional Mental Health Court, the Veterans Court, like you mentioned earlier, and the Community Assessment and Referral for Diversion Program. So as a mental and crisis intervention expert, uh, how have these experiences supported you um, in your current role as the chair of the Senate Behavioral Health Subcommittee? You know, as a prosecutor, um, you actually just, or as someone who works in the advocacy field, you're reacting to what you're saying. 
as a policymaker, you actually are in a position to really think about what is going on with our systems and how can we change that system. So uh, in, the behavior, in, in the Behavioral Health Subcommittee, we have actually been um, taking a look at transforming that system. And you know, all prosecutors, I think, will tell you that the best way to do criminal justice change is to make sure our children graduate with a high school degree. Mm. They don't have to get A's or B's, but simply having that degree, that high school diploma, dramatically reduces the chances of getting involved in the criminal justice system. And I'll say the same that's true for uh, individuals with behavioral health issues that end up in our emergency rooms and our hospitals. If we can provide early intervention, if we can really embrace trauma-informed care for our children, we can really set them up to be in a position where um, they are uh, successful as adults. And so as a policymaker now, what I bring with me are uh, understanding those experiences that people go through, but taking a look at how we can change those systems. So we're not utilizing a criminal justice system, our emergency rooms, uh, our civil commitment laws, but really trying to provide holistic wraparound services so that our children can be successful. Excellent. Um, one more question along the line of mental health. Uh, with so much that we've seen with Black Lives Matter, a lot of the protests that are going on related to um, unarmed individuals being shot and killed, uh, many of whom have uh, a background or a history of mental illness. Um, you know, the Washington Department of Health report just recently stated that 1.6 million residents have reported experiencing, you know, symptoms of anxiety um, and depression. Um, and we know those things play out and exacerbate themselves in in um, communities of color. Um, do, you, do you believe that uh, the, the way in which, you know, if there's a mental health crisis or an emergency that the police should be coming out, do you believe that that is the adequate way to address those situations? Or do you believe in the call um, that Black Lives Matter has given um, for defunding of the police and the reallocation of resources, um, you know, to, uh, First, first responders and to those who have a background in mental health? So I'll just say, I don't think that is a and or situation. Uh, I think these things don't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, I will say that I think everyone needs to acknowledge and say that Black Lives Matter. And I have been so pleased to see um, the uh, Indian Americans come out and uh, embrace that and say that and understand what that means. So um, I just wanna make that absolutely clear because we need to get off of our comfort of being you know, the model minority and really understand and embrace what that means. Um, having said that, uh, I think we absolutely need to do more investment in crisis intervention training and de-escalation. Um, as I mentioned briefly, I actually helped set up the 40-hour crisis intervention training for law enforcement at the Criminal Justice Training Commission, and I was an instructor there uh, until I stepped down to run for office. And I kid you not, every month after I did um, my presentation, I knew that the following week I would get calls from officers, and they would call me, and they would just tell me stories on how they were able to utilize that training in the field right away. Um, there's a story of this officer who once called me and his voice was shaking mm. and he didn't know who to talk to. And so he called me and he was in a situation where there was uh, a man with a knife uh, near school. Uh, and there were like literally five minutes before school was being dismissed. And he said he had his hand on his gun and he, you know, he um, was trying to figure out what to do. And the de-escalation technique uh, kicked in and he was able to talk to the man, he disarmed him just as the school let out. And um, you know that is what we wanna see. We wanna see police take the time to work out what's going on and engage in um, de-escalation. Now, a lot of these stories don't make the news, but we see them happening. But we cannot rely on law enforcement to be the one to call every time there's an emergency. They're actually the only ones who don't have an option but to show up. You know, you can call designated crisis responders, you can call um, mental health professionals. They don't always show up, but the cops always do. So we have to change that to make sure that there is uh, a different response model. And we have been doing some work in the legislature around that in funding co-responder teams, you know, where you have a mental health professional that goes out with law enforcement. 
Um, and I think we really have to have a different system for our 911 operators where they are able to assess, is there a threat? Is someone in danger? And if they're not, then they don't need a law enforcement response. But you know, if there is someone who is having a psychotic break and the weapons in the house and they're causing damage or threatening family members, absolutely you need someone with de-escalation techniques to go out with a mental health professional. So we really have to work on how we do our response. And there's some really cool programs. Um, I know King County has been working on the radar program for quite a few years. And I was involved uh, at this inception of that. Oregon has a CAHOOTS model. So I think we're definitely looking at different options on how we can make that a much better experience for everyone involved. Uh, along the same lines, can you talk a little bit about your evidence-based approach to criminal justice reform? Well, I can spend an hour talking about that. Um, you know, we have learned so much about human behavior. We've learned so much about brain chemistry um, and a lot about, you know, trauma-informed care and how people um, are impacted by, you know, the adverse childhood experiences. And all of these are things that we all have to be aware of in the criminal justice system. And uh, that is, you know, new for the last couple of decades. People really weren't thinking about those kinds of things, and now we know better. And this is what I talk about when we talk about evidence-based um, approaches to the criminal justice system. Uh, King County, we had the second uh, mental health court in the country, and now they're all over the place. And over and over again, you have seen that when you have therapeutic involvement when it comes to mental health, substance use disorder, um, the outcomes are really wonderful. And the reason why they are is because you understand, you have to understand what are the factors that get someone involved in the criminal justice system? And do you have the ability to have a response that addresses those factors? So you have to have the mixing of that, the understanding of the factors and a response to help those factors. And that is when you can make sure people's lives improve. Now, if you don't have that connection, then you really um, have to figure out a different modality. But you know, when you talk about accountability and responsibility, that is, a, that is what you talk about is really making sure you understand those factors because you want to hold people accountable and you want the community to be safe. But you know, locking people away and throwing away the key does neither of those things. Mm -hmm. Because we know that when people leave a current prison system, they're going right back because we're not addressing the underlying factors. And so a lot of what we have seen with Veterans Court, um, Mental Health Court, Community Court, is that understanding of um, adverse childhood experiences, trauma-informed care, understanding um, a risk and understanding responsivity and combining the two. So um, I really look forward to more and more agencies using these uh, new tools and this new understanding of human behavior to make actual real change in our criminal justice system. Excellent. Uh, I want to transition just a bit um, to domestic violence. I know you do a lot of work around this topic. Um, and you know, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the nation, specifically Washington State, um, we've seen an exponential rise in uh, cases of domestic violence. What is it important for our viewers to know about domestic violence? And can you also discuss some of the legislation you've sponsored in past regarding domestic violence? Thank you so much um, for such an important uh, question. I know it's something that's close to your heart um, as well as mine. You know, um, that's the unfortunate truth about domestic violence. It exists in our society regardless of your socioeconomic status, regardless of your education or where you come from. This really is something that deals with power and control issues. And, um, you know, gender-based violence is just something we all have to be very, very mindful of. What COVID has done has basically forced families to be together in a confined area with, n with not having outside interactions. And that absolutely has escalated situations. You know, there were a lot of survivors of domestic violence know they can feel um, the violence starting to come. And in the past, they could do things like leave the home, go outside and seek help, go to their parent's house or a girlfriend's house. And those options weren't available. And um, so we have seen that rise. And for people who work in this field, I think this was something that they could have predicted happening. Um, so I think it's, I'm glad that people are becoming more and more aware of it. 
Uh, I think it definitely highlights the problem. And we really have to make sure that we're stepping up uh, to really solve the underlying causes of domestic violence. And a lot of that has to do with the way women specifically uh, or uh, gender is perceived uh, in our culture. Now, a lot of the things that we have done in the legislature, um, you know, uh, I've done a lot of work around making sure that perpetrators of domestic violence don't have access to a weapon, because we know if there's a weapon in the house, the chances of lethality for a woman goes up by 500%. I mean, it's, um, it's startling. And so, you know, when we come to taking a look at um, gun legislation, it really is about those individuals who have a history of violence um, especially domestic violence, they should not have access to a weapon. And then we did a lot of work in closing the loopholes around protection orders so that when someone gets a protection order that the person that they are protected from does not have their gun because we know that's a very scary time um, for uh, victims who are trying to leave. Now, one of the things we did during the uh, work, I worked with the governor's office on the proclamations around um, domestic violence, making sure that we still have access to the courts on uh, no contact orders and making sure there's an online petition where uh, victims, uh, survivors can still petition uh, for protection. Uh, we helped make sure that there were uh, fewer requirements on getting service to um, the perpetrators. So um, I'm really hoping that the work that we've done during COVID around these uh, easing of our laws will actually go into effect permanently because we have seen that they have really benefited um, survivors in being able to access uh, the courts and uh, protection orders. So um, I will be working on legislation uh, next session to streamline a lot of this and make sure that our survivors do feel protected. Uh, along those same lines, you know, as you know, we are an India-based television network. Uh, would you share with our viewers a bit about API Shaya, an Indian American organization that you started that helps victims of domestic abuse? Absolutely. You know, I really do. Um, I have two teenage kids, but I do think of Shaya as my first child. Um, you know, I got involved in domestic violence work when I was um, uh, at uh, Berkeley getting my undergraduate degree. And, um, and at that time, I used to work at a shelter or volunteer my time at a shelter in Oakland called A Safe Place. And so my training um, in domestic violence advocacy came from very much a main, mainstream um, shelter program. And there were a few women at that time, Indian women, who wanted to start a, um, a South Asian-based domestic violence organization to provide culturally appropriate uh, training. And so I um, started doing that work with this nonprofit called Narika, which was just starting up in uh, Berkeley, California. I then graduated, uh, moved to Seattle um, for law school, and I wanted to continue that work. And so I'd reached out to a lot of our local nonprofits um, doing domestic violence work and asked them, I said, you know, how many South Asians do you serve? And the uh, answer there was always none. And the response to me was, well, we actually don't see that being an issue in the Indian population here. And I'm like, oh, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, uh, at that time, I didn't know a lot of people. And so I, was, I actually reached out through our Indian grocery store and put a little sign up saying, hey, interested in working on domestic violence? Call me. Um, <laughs> and I got in touch with a, with a few women. And I think there was a guy involved then, too who were interested in, again, starting a, a local South Asian domestic violence organization, and that's how Chaya was formed. And, you know, the name actually has a lot of meaning for me because we took a long time coming up with that name, and Chaya means shade. And um, the name actually comes from a Rabindranath Tagore poem that says, on your weary journey, let us provide you with shade. And um, to me, that's, that, that poem is also really important because it talks about the culture of the organization, right? We don't want a survivor to go from being dependent on her abuser to becoming dependent on an organization. We want to empower them. We want to provide them that shade that they need as they continue on their journey. And so, um, so I'm actually really proud of the work that they have been doing. And I stepped off the board when I had my, set, my, my daughter, um, because with two kids and being a prosecutor, I could no longer be on the board. And uh, when the recession hit, Chaya actually merged with another organization called API Safety Center. And so it was, it's now called API Chaya. Um, and at that time, 
uh, I had reached out again and we had talked about the name um, and really making sure that Inchaya continued um, in the organization. So I always talk about the marriage of my, my child and now it's API Chaya. Um, and you know, now they're doing incredible work in, um, in uh, working with survivors of sexual assault, working in trafficking. And you know, these are all issues that unfortunately are prevalent in a South Asian community. And so it's nice to have uh, culturally specific um, services um, to help survivors. Wow, such a powerful story and excellent work. Thank you so much for all the work that you're doing around domestic violence. Um, I want to transition just slightly. Um, you know, you serve on the Poverty Reduction Task Force. Uh, I want you to speak a little bit about what that task force does and why you decided to get involved. You know, um, this is actually, a, um, a, and you know, when I was, uh, when the, this position first became available, um, and they sent that email out. Um, I was interested in it, you know, just given my work with the criminal, cr criminal justice systems, given my work with behavior health, um, and just understanding racism in our country and the origin of our country and how it came about and the manner in which labor has been used in our country um, for so many decades that has really resulted in a lot of people being wealthy and the others not. Um, to me, this is again one of these systemic things that can dramatically change people's lives. So I got interested in it because I, to me it is really connected to um, how we ensure that our children are successful. And I will say, you know, I've been involved in so many different task forces, so many different uh, work groups my entire life. This, being a part of this group has really been transformational. Um, it has, I will say, changed my life. Um, and that's because part of this makeup of this group is actually hearing from people who have lived experiences. When they talk about what they have gone through, we uh, had a big understanding of uh, education around intergenerational poverty. We did a lot of learning about intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. and those things have really opened my eyes to a lot of the issues um, that involve our indigenous community, our black community. And um, it really has been such a powerful experience. And so, um, I, and you know, they have a report, a 10 year plan on reducing uh, poverty in the state. And I uh, will be doing a lot of work, policy work around making sure that those policy recommendations are um, enacted in our state. Because as a state, you know, when we say we're gonna help our most vulnerable, we're gonna help people, you can't just help them during that emergency. You have to have a plan for them to exit poverty. And we don't talk about that, you know? Yes, we can help you now, but what's gonna happen in three years? You, want, you need to make sure you're setting them up to exit poverty and on a path to generate wealth because that is what our country has not been doing very well for certain sectors uh, of people. There are some people who are able to generate that wealth and others aren't because of uh, barriers that our government, our institutions have placed in their way. So um, there's a lot of work to be done in this arena, a lot of barriers that have to be removed, and we have to adjust our way of thinking on when uh, we say, you know, what does it mean to exit poverty and what poverty looks like. Exactly. Uh, okay, let's transition a bit uh, to the uh, transition back rather to the pandemic. Uh, Washington State uh, was one of the first states to report a patient with COVID-19. And at the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, the state was under close watch as the virus continued to spread. Today, the state is managing better than some of its Midwestern and Southern counterparts. Would you support a full lockdown if things became unmanageable in the state in the future? So um, I am actually very proud of the way in which our governor has handled uh, the pandemic. He has been in, con uh, in close contact with leadership in the Senate and the House. Um, and I, I think relying on science and data is really what has driven our success uh, nationally. We, you know, we've never had a full lockdown. We cannot have a full lockdown because um, people need groceries. Uh, people need uh, medical care. We need behavioral health systems. So, um, so there is no scenario where there's a, a full lockdown. I think 
some of the uh, policies we have enacted about wearing masks, about having social distancing. I think the stay home, stay healthy order is again very important. And you know, watching those phases, um, if there's a third wave coming, and it seems like there is, we're seeing those numbers rise again. I think having people educated on, listen, stay home, don't interact with other people. Um, I think that is the way to go. And um, hopefully the residents of the state of Washington wash their hands regularly, cover their uh, faces with masks and uh, socially distance because that is what is going to get us out of here. Along with having a vaccine, I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, by spring next year we have one and um, that people have faith that the manner in which it was developed and tested is accurate. And um, I'm looking forward to having more in-person meetings hopefully next summer. Awesome. Senator, I wish we had more time. Uh, the time is flying by. Hopefully we can have you back on again soon um, for another great conversation. Um, but before we go, I do want to ask you, where can our followers uh, go to keep up with what you're doing, follow your campaign and donate? Thank you so much for that. It has actually been a lovely uh, conversation. I'm always happy to come back. Um, yes, you can follow me on Facebook at Manka Dhingra. I have an official Senate page as well as um, my campaign page. Um, you can follow me on Twitter uh, and you can follow me on Instagram. And uh, of course, as uh, politicians, unfortunately, we do rely on um, campaign donations in order to run for office and uh, donations can be made at my website, electmanka.com. And that's E-L-E-C-T-M-A-N-K-A.com. Thank you so much for that question. Of course. And thank you so much again for joining us. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And to our viewers, thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time.